Okay, testing, sounds good. All right, might as well get started. Um, so I'm gonna, my name is John Arthorn. I'm a committer on the Eclipse and Equinox and Orion projects and a member of the uh, PMC of the Eclipse project. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today. I have a very modestly titled talk, The Future of Eclipse. So um, there's actually an interesting history of this talk. It was um, the day of the, the uh, deadline for submitting talks for EclipseCon Europe. And I was having a conversation with Mike Wilson, the uh, Eclipse project lead, about, you know, we just finished shipping Eclipse 4.2, and this was kind of the, the end of this five-year process from starting the E4 project to getting it out as a, you know, a mature release. And we were, we were like, you know, this is, we just finished shipping this, and we're like, okay, what's next? What's going to happen in the next five years? What's going to happen in the next 10 years? Like, what's the, the long-term trends that we need to look at? Um, so I, I quickly went off and submitted a, a proposal. And first, I, you know, our conversation was, what's the long term? What will Eclipse 7 or 8 look like? And I thought, well, it'll be kind of confusing if I uh, submit a talk called on Eclipse 7. Uh, people wonder what the heck I'm talking about. So I entered a talk called Eclipse 5. So I submitted this proposal, and then I immediately started hearing this buzz about, they're announcing Eclipse 5 at EclipseCon Europe. And this was not my intent. My intent was, what's the long term? What's going to happen in the next 10 years? It's not what's coming in Kepler or the next release after that. So I quickly changed the title to The Future of Eclipse. And then just last week, this one hour time slot came available and I thought, well, I've got a lot of slides. Let's put it in this time slot. So this is the extended edition of The Future of Eclipse. So before I get into detail, I want to give you a big disclaimer. Um, you know, I've never actually given a talk about th like this. You know, I've usually always talked about what I'm doing today, what I'm doing maybe next year, what I did last year, but what's going to happen in 10 years? I mean, this is uh, an experiment for me to, to tr try to talk about this. And, you know, I'm just really telling you my, my personal thoughts on the long-term direction. Um, you know, I'm not speaking for the Eclipse Project. I'm not speaking for IBM. This is just my thoughts. And um, I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts, too. So I'm going to have a boff tonight, and people can come and talk about, you know, tell me that my ideas are crazy and, uh, and you know, have an interesting discussion about it. So what's my agenda for today? So I'm going to, you know, make some sweeping generalizations about where the industry is going. I'm going to make, you know, completely fabricate some conjectures about how this will impact Eclipse. I'm going to make some completely wild claims about the direction that open source communities are going. And because this talk is in the community track, I'm going to finish it with, I'll try to say some nice things about the Eclipse community. So let's see how this goes. So the big narrative you hear in the industry now, like if you read the mainstream technology press, is about the death of the PC. Like this idea that there is this progression from uh, you know, PCs to tablets and, and, and smartphones, you know, that that is the direction we're going, and this is linear shift from, from PC to these mobile devices. So you hear you know, statistics supporting this uh, every day. Um, just a couple of them. Uh, last year, 488 million smartphones were sold and only 400 million PCs. And there's uh, this industry analyst chart here that has um, forecast, uh, actual, actual sales of PCs versus tablets and forecast sales showing by, uh, so the, what is it, the, the blue line, the, yeah, the dark blue is basically traditional PCs and everything above that is tablets. So it's showing that by 2013, tablets will overtake PCs uh, form factor. But if you dig into these, these, these statistics in a little bit more detail, what, it's actually quite interesting what you see. You know, that showed, um, you know, plunging, the, the PC is going down. But if you look at the actual sales numbers, so in, in this chart, the, uh, the light blue and below is traditional form factor PCs and above that is tablets. So it, you can see that the growth is in tablets, but people are still buying uh, PCs. And they're actually, you know, the sales of PCs are actually fairly stable. And yet we're still seeing this explosive growth of tablets. So it's kind of a, it's more of an additive change where tablets are being added to the mix. Uh, PCs are still very much 
uh, with us. Let's move that out of the way. So just another kind of anecdotal um, statistic that I saw go by this summer that, that you know, reinforces this idea that, it's a, a, that everyone's growing. Uh, NBC gave out these statistics. Um, they got these numbers halfway through the London Olympics this summer, showing the number of users of their digital content across various platforms. And they showed, so this is showing, you know, the, the complete uh, Beijing Olympics versus half of the London Olympics. So it's kind of hard to compare, but you can see that, you know, the big story is mobile apps. You know, they didn't have a mobile app in Beijing, and then in London they did, and they had, you know, 10 million users of these apps. Uh, so it's an explosive growth there. But if you look at the mobile web and you look at PCs, uh, there was also growth there. So, you know, it's digital eng engagement across all these different devices as opposed to uh, a sh just a simple shift. So what's really going on here? So um, David Clark, who's a, a professor at MIT, um, coined this term the post-PC era uh, in the late 90s. Um, it wasn't Steve Jobs in 2007. It was actually uh, much, much longer ago. And he wasn't talking about like taking the keyboard off a tablet and making the screen smaller. He was actually talking about a, a much more fundamental transformation in how we use computers. And I mean, I, I highly recommend the transcript of, his, of the talk he gave is available, and I highly recommend you know do a Google search and and give it a read. But the basic idea is that you know if you go way back in the past, the computers were really big and expensive, and we had to share them. So there was this many-to-one ratio between machines and people, um, and machines got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper until they reached this magical ratio of one-to-one. -one. So one person per machine, one machine per display. Um, and that is a very valuable uh, ratio. It makes a lot of things easier. You don't have to deal with um, you know, splicing your app between uh, client and server. You, you, know, you just have to install your software on one device. Um, it has a lot of very useful properties. But what's happening now is that uh, devices are, keep getting cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller, and now the ratio is going the other way where you can have, any individual can have many devices available to them. So what's actually happening is you can now, you're no longer forced to, you know, hunch over a PC to do um, things that are not suitable to that form factor. You know, you have these devices with very different form factors available to you and the choice of which one you use very much depends on what you're doing and what environment you're in. So. You know, even a given task like email, you know, it, I quite like writing emails on a desktop computer, but for reading email, I greatly prefer, you know, lying on the couch with a tablet. So it really varies um, based on what you're doing, where you are. You know, if you're in a car, a voice interface to your computer makes a lot of sense. But if you're in a quiet office, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So there's basically all these devices available and what device is appropriate really depends on your current environment and you really want to be able to switch between different form factors depending on where you are or what you're doing at any given moment. So to enable this, you, you kind of have to decouple the software from the device, right? So this is a lot of the, the cloud stuff that you're hearing about. One of the big advantages is that um, you know, it enables you to move around and your software services kind of move around with you and you don't have to worry about installing your software on, you know, many different devices and moving your data around yourself. So for programmers, you know, what's the impact here? What, what challenges does it create for us? And the big one is how the heck do we reach our users? How do we get our software and our content to our users, right? So when Eclipse was born and most of the life of Eclipse, this was what cross-platform looked like. It was you know, mostly Windows on the desktop, a bit of Linux and Mac, and then a bunch of server platforms. And Java solved this problem for us quite well. I mean, it was, it was, um, you know, it came along at the right time, and it was the right answer to that problem, and it, and it worked very well for Eclipse and, and many others. But now, 
this is the problem that we're looking at. You know, people who are producing, you know, you think of like a media company or someone producing content or, or games or any kind of software for end users. The problem isn't, you know, how do I get across Windows, Linux, Mac? It's how do I get across all these different platforms? So, you know, some of these are, you know, car platforms, some of them are television platforms, some of them are mobile, some are desktop, some are server. Um, there's a lot of different platforms at play here. And so the critical thing is here, if you misread what's happening right now, uh, you might not be worried about this because you might think, you know, when a, when a technology is new, you have many different players and then it eventually, through competition and amalgamation, it boils down to one or two platforms. And I'll just wait until that, that all that settles out and let's say the winner is, you know, iOS, iOS plus Android, then I just have to do those two and I'm done. Um, so if you think that the tr if it's just a simple progression from a PC to mobile, then you might think, okay, I'll just wait for the winners and then I'll pick the winners that I'm done. But if the shift is actually um, not this simple progression from one form factor to another, but this decoupling, this unhinging, um, I think I put it up there, this, the brilliant quote that, uh, that David Clark gave, that when this ratio of one to one comes up and stuck, it's gonna be a, you know, a very violent change in the industry. And he was, you know, given this was 13 years ago, it's absolutely brilliant observation. So, many people tout the solution to this problem of reaching our users in the current era is, you know, HTML plus JavaScript plus CSS. So I have some, you know, supporting evidence for, you know, what's, what's, wrong, with, what's, what's wrong with that. So, um, you know, I did a Google search for JavaScript sucks and I got 17 million hits. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of arguments that saying that JavaScript is not good enough. And there's many good, you know, good arguments for that. And last month, Mark Zuckerberg made this statement um, that HTML5 was the, betting on HTML5 was the biggest mistake their companies made. And the media had a field day with this. They were like, you know, they boiled it down to the choices between web and native on, on, ta on mobile and native is winning. But the interesting thing is, so all the reports I, I read, you know, mentioned this Mark Zuckerberg betting on HTML5 was a mistake. The very next sentence he said in that, in that interview was that it's not that HTML5 is bad, it's actually really important to them. Uh, mobile web, Facebook has more users than iOS and Android combined. So he wasn't saying um, it's a choice between native and mobile and, um, sorry, native and web, and web was the wrong answer. He was saying um, web is still extremely important, but native uh, behavior on, on you know, the key platforms was, was you know, very important too. So it was, uh, you know, what got reported was this, HTML5 is bad, but what he was really saying was, it's not ready yet. We had to uh, increase the level of our native functionality to get the behavior we wanted. So the interesting thing here is that there's the, inno the level of innovation in this area of solving this cross-platform cross -platform problem is amazing. I mean, it's, I, I have to apologize for this slide being out of date because I, uh, I only wrote it on Sunday and now it's Wednesday. So I'm, I'm sure there's been you know, six more technologies available since then. Um, it's a really furious innovation in this area. I mean, basically there's a small group of people who want to lock you into one platform, and then there's a lot of people who just want to get their content to their users, and they want you know, the easiest way to do that. And there's a lot of people looking at how to solve that problem. So I think um, we haven't arrived at, at what that solution looks like yet, um, but you know, there's a lot of brilliant people working on it, and I think it's gonna be happening soon. So what's the, on, let me just take a drink of water here. So what's the impact of this shift for Eclipse? So I, I kind of broke it down into some of the different uh, major areas that Eclipse is in and what impact these changes are having on Eclipse. So the first area is servers and you know, the impact for in this area is quite different. It's, there's gonna be a much 
greater demand on servers. Um, you know, a lot of the things that John, John D was saying in his talk this morning, um, the challenges of scaling up, of handling multi-tenancy and things like that. So um, I think Java and OSGI and Equinox are still, you know, very viable, very strong um, options on, for the server side. And at Eclipse, there's quite a lot of innovation happening. Um, you know, Equinox, the, the work that Equinox is doing around modularity, uh, Jetty, Virgo, Gemini, GRX, there's, there's quite a lot of projects at Eclipse that are really active in this area, and it, it looks very promising for Eclipse. One, you know, little piece of advice that I would give is, you know, do, you have your client in your server, and locking yourself into a particular server solution um, isn't a good idea. I think this is just good programming practice. Uh, you should use the abstraction of HTTP between your client and your server and try not try to avoid making too many assumptions about your server technology on the client and vice versa. I know it's not always that simple, but um, I think that separation of concerns is very important. So what's the impact of this, these changes on tools? So here the story is a little bit more complicated. Um, I really think that in the long term, uh, programming is inherently a very social task. The data is going to want to be uh, on a shared resource. You know, we're, wa we're going to want to be able to use all these different devices uh, to, in our daily uh, programming lives, and that the shift to having the data on, on the server uh, and having the tools on all these various um, local devices is going to happen. Um, but it's not such an immediate shift because it turns out that the desktop form factor, you know, the keyboard, the large display, and the mouse are actually pretty well suited for a lot of programming tasks. So there isn't this imminent um, need to shift as there is in, in some other areas. But I do think the, the shift is happening. You know, we can already see it. It's already been happening for five years, right? A lot of our programming um, tools, you know, Bugzilla, uh, Garrett with code review, uh, you know, Stack Overflow with with, with, with help and, and interacting with the community, Hudson, you know, technologies like that. You know, we're already shifting towards um, moving the services, you know, the, the services that we use for programming in that direction. So it's a matter of how long, you know, how long will that take? I don't know, but I think that's the, you know, the direction things are going. Um, the Eclipse platform, I think, is a good stepping stone for, you know, the desktop tools are going to be around for, for many years to come, and I think Eclipse Platform 4, I mean, if you saw Tom Schindel's demo yesterday with um, Eclipse Platform 4 running on a totally different uh, UI, he had a Java ID um, where the UI was in JavaFX with a web-based editor. You can see the, what the possibilities are there. Um, it's, a, it's a great stepping stone to make this transition. And there's a lot of other innovation, you know, happening in Eclipse in the area in this area for uh, for tools. You know, there's the Orion project, of course, Hudson, WikiText, um, M2M. M2M, I mentioned there, it's it's kind of in a different way. The machine to machine is really um, very much what you know what David Clark was talking about there, where you have this in, ubiquitous environment of devices, and they all have to interact with each other. And I think that machine to machine area is is going to be really important over the next few years. So what's the impact for rich client application development? Um, I think this really depends very much on what that rich client application is doing. You know, there's lots of different kinds of rich clients, and there's lots of different uh, needs. And, and if you think about what are the environmental factors, you know, are, my, are the users of my rich client application wanting to, you know, use a mobile device or a tablet or a television or in their car? Um, and in some cases, the answer is no, right? The, the, the desktop or laptop form factor is suitable. Um, but I, I really think in the long run, um, I mean, I think I said here, yeah, Java clients will become niche. I mean, that's already, I think many would say that's already the case, right? I mean, Java has, on the client side has always been a bit of a niche area, um, but I think that, that that area is getting a little, a little bit smaller and you know, a lot of rich client applications are going to need to move to other technologies to be able to, to reach their users. Uh, and in, in Eclipse, there's a lot of innovation going on uh, in rich clients today. Uh, Eclipse Platform 4, 
um, you know, RAP has uh, RAP Mobile, and they're also exploring uh, using the pluggable rendering story in Eclipse Platform 4 to uh, render an Eclipse Platform uh, in, a, in a web UI. So there's lots of really interesting things going on here, uh, projects exploring uh, this shift and how, it, you know, what we can do to, to make a rich, cloud for, uh, rich, rich client platform uh, environment uh, for this kind of decoupled, uh, decentralized world. So I want to just shift a little bit. Uh, I've just mostly been talking about technology, uh, and I want to just shift and talk about uh, community a little bit. Like, what, what, what is our community going to look like in five to ten years? So this is what our community looks like today. We look like a bunch of dorks. This is a picture from EclipseCon a few years ago. Um, I think I'm in that picture somewhere, but I don't see. So there's a number of threats to um, or perceived threats to um, you know, communities, open source, com traditional open source communities like Eclipse. So one of them is this idea of foundationless open source, or I think some people have called it post open source. Uh, so you know, the explosion of popularity of, of forges like GitHub. I mean, this, this slide shows that you know, three years ago, GitHub had 10,000 repositories, and as of last month, they had nearly 4 million uh, unique repositories. So there's definitely something going on here, right? I mean, it's very, it, it's, it's amazing the, the, the rate of growth that we're seeing there, and there's got to be some reasons behind it. So, I mean, a lot of this community discussion started with this, this blog post by Michael, Michael Rogers about, um, you know, he, he, he called it Apache considered harmful, but what he was talking about was um, that we have to rethink the reasons for our open source foundations. It's not good enough to just provide infrastructure and um, you know, a governance model. You have, to, you have to be able to do more to, to solve, you know. There's a reason why, why open source projects are, are moving away and we have to analyze those reasons and, and make sure that foundations remain relevant. And you know, he pointed out in, in, in this blog post that, you know, the interesting thing about GitHub is that it, it takes the notion of contribution and elevates it to be of primary importance. So in, you know, traditional open source communities such as Eclipse and Apache, um, contributions are accepted and there's a process for accepting contributions, um, but it's not made a kind of first class and primarily, primary and as frictionless as it is uh, in GitHub, right? Like GitHub, you just, you, you know, you one click fork, you make a change, change request, it's absolutely trivial uh, to make a contribution. So I have a number of, you know, different answers to this, to this proposal that, you know, open source, um, traditional open source communities are irrelevant. Um, one is that I think it really depends on what you're building. Um, this slide I borrowed from Mike Malinkovich, um, it shows the number of megabytes of software in, in Boeing aircraft. He showed this to me last week. And my first thought was, how long does it take to, to get to Germany by boat? Because I was you know, about to travel to Germany. Uh, but the second thing I was thinking is that, you know, I'm kind of glad that the software in in an Airbus aircraft isn't just a GitHub project that everyone can fork and make changes to. You know, there's, there are software applications where some level of additional process is extremely important. So the second concern with, you know, this, this idea that we can just throw all this process away and just throw our code up on GitHub and, and be happy is you know, that it kind of disregards the legal aspect, which is extremely important for people who are trying to ship commercial software. So, you know, someone pointed out the other day that 40% of repositories on GitHub had no license at all. So, you know, who here understands the legal implications of, of consuming software with no license? Yeah, a few, okay. That's kind of what I figured, you know. 
notice I didn't put my hand up. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, really what, when the software has no license, it means you, no one, the author has not granted the right to use it effectively. So, and that's just, the license is really just the most trivial aspect, right? It's very easy to just slap up a license. Um, the more thorny problems are things like provenance. Where did the code come from? Who wrote it? Did they have the right to contribute under that license? Uh, you know, the, for people shipping commercial applications, these are extremely important questions. And you know, I, the uh, U.S. Patent Office publishes statistics on on, on patent grants. So I kind of dug through the database and added up all the software patent grants. And you can see, you know, a clear trend there, right? Like the number of software patents is going up and up and up. It's you know increasing, at, um, you know, every year. And you know, this is. You know, it, does, it only takes a few lines of code to violate a patent. It's, you know, it's a very scary problem for people shipping commercial software. Um, you know, it's it's multi-billion-dollar lawsuit. Important that you that you ensure that your code is is clean. So another aspect of of Eclipse that I think adds tremendous value. I mean, this I think slide gets shown by a lot of people, um, but the idea of predictability. So. In, in the Orion project that I work on day to day, we've tried to consume uh, a number of different components from, from GitHub projects, and you know, very rarely do they publish a schedule of when their next release is coming out. And actually, many of them don't even bother with the notion of releases. They just keep hacking away in the master branch, and you just pull stuff from master and hope that it works. And if you're consuming multiple different projects and you're trying to get them to work together, um, it's really difficult. So this idea of having software that uh, is released on a predictable schedule and where multiple components um, are coordinated and are able, you know, you have some level of confidence that you can pull components from different projects and at a given moment in time and have them, having, having them work together um, is extremely valuable for, for the consumers of those components. So I think what it comes down to in the end is, you know, you know, this might look like a list of pros and cons, but I, I really don't think it is. It's a matter of, you know, uh, community forges and uh, open source foundations like Eclipse ha just have very different value propositions. It really depends on what you're doing. I mean, a lot of software developers look at this bottom list of no process, no schedules, and no governments, and they go, yes, you know, that's where I'm going to put my code. That sounds awesome. Um, but someone who's trying to ship a commercial product, you know, looks at that and says, you know, no way, there's no way I can use that. You know, I need these, you know, the control, the, the legal infrastructure, you know, the, the vendor neutral environment where I can ensure that, you know, that I won't get, you know, hosed by some uh, competitor out there. Um, so I think it really depends on what software you're building, what your needs are uh, as to which of these two environments uh, is, a, is appropriate for you. But I do think that the increase of, you know, that, that dramatic increase of GitHub projects is telling us something. Um, it's telling us that uh, the processes at traditional foundations are too heavy. So I know the Eclipse Foundation, one of their, their big uh, strategic, strategic goals for next year is what they're calling, what Mike Milikovic is calling the process diet. So they're planning to reanalyze every aspect of the Eclipse development process. Um, you know, why does it take two weeks to create a new committer? Why does it take, you know, a year to create a new project? You know, we have to look at every aspect of this pro process and ask ourselves, um, is it necessary? Um, maybe it's necessary for some projects, but not for others. Uh, we have to have the flexibility here where we can cut down this process, um, make it really easy to contribute, to create new committers, to create new projects. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of details to work through here. Um, you know, there's lots of pros and cons you have to look at, but I, I really think it's important that we, you know, that we leave no stone unturned here and we look at everything that we're doing at the foundation and make sure that um, any process we're adding is, is necessary and there's a reason for it. And if there are projects that don't need that process, they have a way to, to you know, slim it down or, or simplify it. 
So a second major threat, you know, there's no discussion of the future of Eclipse can, can be had without talking about the problem of lack of contributors, right? I know when, when the E4 project started, uh, this was a big discussion thread as well about how do we attract more people to, to be committers on the platform. So this slide is showing uh, the number of lines of code in the platform today versus uh, the number of contributors on that platform for any given year. So last year, um, for every, con every contributor, that's not just committer, but contributor, there were 70,000 lines of code being maintained. So, you know, this trajectory is not healthy, right? You know, we realized that we can't go on um, with an increasing level of code with a decreasing number of contributors. So we really have to think about what, you know, what to do about this. So I know if you're, if you're one of those people with 70,000 lines of code um, and you look at the number of users, you might, your first reaction might be, you know, you know, anger at, you know, how come there's more and more people using it but less and less contributing. But, you know, I really think we have, that, that is not the right mindset. Uh, users are not the problem here. So this, this debate is often called um, the tragedy of the commons, right? But, so in economic theory, the tragedy of the commons, the, the idea was that, you know, communities have this common, common pasture, and if it gets overused, then it gets destroyed, and we can no longer, uh, no longer use it. But that's, you know, that's the wrong metaphor for software because uh, overuse does not kill software. It's, you can make billions of copies of software for free. It, it really has no impact. So, you know, overuse is not, is not the problem, and the, the idea of the tragedy of the commons is, is really the wrong metaphor for the problem. So what are some of the barriers? Like, what are some of the, the, the underlying reasons why there are less contributors? So, you know, the first one that often comes up is that there's no reason to contribute because the platform's good enough as it is. Um, you know, if we don't contribute, someone else will contribute. So let's just wait and see what happens. Um, another one that I think is really interesting is that it's actually really hard to contribute to the platform on a small scale. Like, let's say you're a small company, you're building a commercial application based on Eclipse, and you want to make some contribution back. Well, having someone being a committer is, you know, it's a, it takes a long time to ramp up a new committer, like, to learn all that code, to understand, you know, the, how the development works, how the team works. Um, it's a big investment, and, you, you know, you really have to go deep. You have to pick a very small area and say, I'm going to have a committer in that small area. Um, but the next year, maybe your needs and your business change and you really want to be working in another area, and then you have to go through all that work again of building up that deep expertise. And it's really hard to... I mean, basically no company has the resources to build up the deep expertise in everything, right? I mean, IBM tried to do this for many years, but it's, it's just way too expensive. It's really difficult to, you know, to have the to have both the depth and the breadth of expertise, you know, from, from a single company. So another barrier to contribution, um, you know, e economists call this um, a market failure um, because basically um, open source software is a public good. So if you think about, you know, uh, the, the traditional example that's always used is lighthouses. So. Um, it's very hard to make a business selling lighthouse services because you can't deny someone access to a lighthouse if they don't pay. Um, so that's, you know, um, open source software is very much the same kind of thing. It's, there is no way to create a market for something that you can't charge money for effectively. You know, if you, if you imagine if the government came out today and said, you can no longer charge for beer. So you can continue to produce beer, but you can no longer sell it for money. You know, that is a strong, uh, beer would still be produced, but it's a strong, strong suppressant um, to the, um, to creating, a, to producers, right? I mean, the incentive to produce um, has significantly de decreased. So how do we increase contribution? Um, you know, there's a lot of people have talked about this. There's a lot of different approaches that people have tried. 
um, you know, I'll give you some of them here and you can, you can try them on your own project and see what happens. So, you know, the first one is guilt. Um, you know, you save millions of dollars um, by moving to this open source software. You know, you, the right thing to do would be to give back. So, you know, that doesn't work because, you know, businesses have different moral imperatives than individuals, right? I mean, they, they operate on, they have to have a business need to do something before they'll move. So another idea that's been suggested is charity. Like maybe we could do like Wikipedia and ask for donations and we can get our money that way. Um, I'm kind of, I mean, we could try it, but I'm kind of skeptical that it would, it would raise the amount of money that would be needed to maintain the, you know, the platform. So an, another idea when you have a public good like a lighthouse is the state takes it over. So uh, in this case, it would be maybe the Eclipse Foundation could take over development of the platform um, and I think that's, that is an interesting model. I mean, the Mozilla Foundation operates in that way. Um, but the big problem is they need a revenue stream to employ those developers. So, you know, there's a big problem there of how do we get that stable level of funding so that the foundation could take over development of the platform. And, you know, a final area that I think is where we can make some incremental improvements is the stuff I was talking about before. Like maybe we, we can cut down our processes, we can, you know, we can encourage people to fork and we can encourage the, the flow of contribution between people and that can help uh, increase the level of contribution. So another, you know, these are just ideas, you know, that, that, that are floating around. Um, there's a huge demand for changes to the platform, right? So you can't charge money for the software, but if you want to have a fix or if you want to have a new feature developed, there's, there's, there's this huge uh, pent-up demand for these things, right? Everyone who's building commercial products based on the Eclipse platform, their customers have requirements that they want satisfied, they have bugs they want fixed. So there is a huge demand here. The problem is how do we create a market where uh, businesses can can step in and satisfy that demand and, 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 and contribute development to the platform and get paid for it. Because that's, that's really the, what it comes down to for a business. They need to have a funding model if they want, you know, for them to contribute uh, to the platform. So I think, I don't know, I think there's some promise in this idea. I think that if, you know, the long-term support program that's starting at Eclipse has this model where different companies can set up um, kind of their own uh, fork of, of the platform or of whatever uh, components they're consuming and they can contribute resources to that and we have an infrastructure where we can we can share those fixes back and forth. I think, you know, letting go of that fear of, of forks and uh, encouraging people to go off and do their own thing um, I think could be a positive change. I mean, if you think about it, one, one thing that makes it very hard to make, to make change or to add new features is that everyone has to come to an agreement before um, a change can be made um, you know, in the platform. You know, one company might really want a breaking change to something because that's what, you know, it's, it, it supports a requirement for their customers, but another consumer of the platform doesn't want that breaking change because they'll have to migrate. So, you know, how can we allow these different companies to get their own demand satisfied um, and create an environment where, you know, we encourage everyone to go off and make the changes they want and we have an environment where we can share these, these changes as we see fit and have a mechanism for contributing these changes back if it's appropriate. So I think that's a really interesting area. Um, I guess we really have to see how the long-term support program, you know, it's really just getting started, but I think there's, there's, some, there's some potential there. So I'm getting close to the end of time. So I think at the end, you know, we are undergoing, the software industry is undergoing huge changes. Um, you know, we're seeing this really fundamental change between, um, you know, this old era of the PC, the one-to-one -one ratio uh, to computers are everywhere, software services can move around or data can move around. 
um, it's a really fundamental change in, in our industry. And, you know, I really can't predict what's going to happen with technology over the next five years. I mean, who, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, I don't think any of us predicted, you know, five years ago that tablets would overtake PCs next year. I mean, it's just, the, the transformation has just been incredible. But what I do know is that, what I'm confident in is that, regardless of what happens with technology, I think the Eclipse Foundation community, you know, the, the whole mechanism we have in place, um, you know, this, this um, vendor neutral environment, the IP processes, um, you know, commercial friendly license, the predictable schedules, you know, I really think we have all the ingredients here that we're really the best place uh, for producing commercial friendly software today. So I really think, you know, the technologies are going to be changing a lot, but the community, you know, has to make some evolutionary steps, but I think it's a really uh, excellent place for developing software. So that's all I have for today. Thanks. So I can have a boff tonight at, uh, I think it's at nine o'clock. Um, you have to check the schedule out there for the name of the room. Um, but if you have any ideas for, you know, what, what, we, what, we, what things are gonna look like in five or 10 years, where things are headed, what we should be doing differently, um, I'd love for you to come out and we can have a discussion about it.